You're very welcome to this video talk. Now, I've had not a few comments and questions on the BBC article recently, which uh, debunks ivermectin. Now, this is the study here, published on the BBC News website. Ivermectin, how false science created a COVID miracle drug. Now, I can't flick through this and show you it because it's got a lot of uh, copyrighted images on it, which I'm not allowed to use. But I put the link there. You can flick on it and read through it yourself. So the BBC um, has got a really good international reputation, the British Broadcasting Corporation, because it used to be a really good uh, organisation. So if you haven't, if you're outside and you haven't in the United States or something, the BBC, so it's like a national institution in, in the UK, and it used to be really good. Anyway, they, they, they've done this article to uh, basically debunk ivermectin. Now, it's very good of the BBC because here we all are getting a bit confused and they come in and they do this thing. The article's called a reality check. So we're a bit divorced from reality. And then the BBC bring us back to reality, that which is true in objective empirical realism. So it's good of the BBC to do that. And this was done via two journalists. Now, on a completely separate matter, I've had a bit of a bad tummy lately, I must say. Uh, I, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and see a journalist to get it properly diagnosed. They, they, they'll know what's wrong with me. And uh, you can you can imagine it. If you, you're going for an operation and, and uh, someone walks up to you in green scrubs and says, well, I'm Mr. Smith. Uh, I, I'm a journalist. I'm going to be doing your anaesthetic. And, and and this is Mrs. Patel. She's the, she's the journalist. She's going to be doing the operation. I don't think so. You know, these people are journalists. And as far as I can see, these individuals are just journalists. They're not science graduates. They're not doctors. And yet they, they they seem to have this great wisdom, which they kindly bestow on the rest of us. So that's nice. Anyway, so let's look at it. Um, this is the so-called reality check. BBC reality check. Now, um, but the BBC can reveal. That, now, it's in italics. It's a direct quote from the source I am using. Uh, the BBC can reveal there are serious areas in numbers of key studies about the, the, that proponent, the drug proponents rely on. So there's something really wrong with studies that people who think ivermectin might be efficacious and safe. Well, they rely on studies which have been debunked now, apparently, it would appear. Uh, but thousands of supporters, many of them anti-vaccine activists, have continued to vigorously campaign for its use. Um, now... What is the fact that these people are, uh, many people are anti-vaccine act activists? Is that true? They give no evidence for that. Uh, let's take uh, me, for example, and uh, a lot of other people I've been talking to. We are very pro-vaccination because we want to prevent human pain, suffering and death via disease. But we're also very pro-treatment. If treatments are available, we want that treatment. We, I'm greedy. I want both. I want to help as many people as much as I can. That's what you go into healthcare for. And anyway, so so th is this a false dichotomy that's been set up here? I'll let, I'll let you decide that. It could be a false dichotomy. And apparently, members of social media groups have been swapping tips to get hold of drugs, even advocating versions used for animals. Oh, dear. So is, is it an animal medicine? Is it a horse medicine? Is that the implication there? Um, I think they forget to mention in the video, in, in the article, rather, that 3.7 billion doses of this have been given to uh, to humans, but... And it is, rightly, as they say, used for veterinary purposes as well. Now, I think most of this BBC article seems to be based on um, this study here, which is published in Nature Medicine. Lessons of ivermectin meta-analysis based on summary data alone are inherently unreliable. And I want to look at this article in some detail shortly. But for now, just one thing I want to notice, the lead author of this paper that the BBC seem to be relying on so heavily is Jack Lawrence. I'm sure Jack's a very intelligent chap. And there's a one there beside his name. So one relates to St George's University Hospital London in the United Kingdom. So St George's University Hospital London, United Kingdom, presumably a professor or a senior academic. Well, no, actually, he's a student there. These other people are uh, academics, doctors or other academics. But uh, to have a student as a lead author that the BBC article relies on so heavily is, uh, let, let, let's just say some might find that uh, surprising. I make no comment, of course. Now, um, large pro-ivermectin Facebook groups, again, direct quotes from the article. 
have turned into forums for people who find advice on where to buy it, including preparations meant for animals again. Of course, we would strongly condemn that on this channel. We should never take drugs that are designed for animal use. They could be different and different in doses. Very bad idea indeed. Um, but anyway, so that, that's that's kind of another point that's put up. Now we're not we're not saying that we're not saying ivermectin is good or bad here. We're just critiquing this article from the BBC that debunks. Because, um, you know, who guards the guardians? Who debunks the debunkers that, that have got this massive publicity machine behind them in the official media of the, the BBC? Uh, the BBC can reveal that more than a third of 26 major trials of the drug for use on COVID have serious errors or signs of potential fraud. Oh, I don't like the sound of that. Fraud. Poten potential fraud. Even, even, even the message of the word fraud I don't like. Now, this seems to be based, again, as we say on this publication here, um, or even here. And um, these, this academic group, um, Jack Lawrence there is the, is the leading author, apparently. Um, this academic group have apparently looked at 26 studies. But the 26 studies that they look at are not in this article the critique of the 26 studies they look at are not in this article. And in fact, this article contains no research data at all, as far as I can see. There's a seven references there, which we might come back to later on. It's basically an opinion piece, and we'll be talking about the opinion later, but it doesn't contain, it doesn't tell us which of these 26 articles uh, were studied. We, we, we don't know. We, we simply don't know. We just know what the BBC deigns to tell us, that this that the BBC can reveal that more than a third of so more than a third so what's the third of twenty six I don't know eight or something ma ma major trials of the drug so, so presumably the other two thirds are okay but they, they don't say that uh, the group of oh, it's a group of independent scientists Phew, thank goodness for that uh, led led it would, appear, it would appear by a student but it's a group of independent scientists. Um, the group of independent scientists uh, examined virtually every randomized controlled trial on ivermectin and COVID. The group of independent scientists have had virtually every randomised controlled trial. Well, I thought it said they measured 26 of them, but there you go. Uh, do the BBC think that 26 is nearly all of them? I don't know. Now, this is a social media group, apparently. Um, it's a Twitter group. So this group, this international group of scientists is, in fact, a Twitter group. Now, I, I, this is not saying that what they're saying is good, bad or indifferent. I'm just, I'm just reflecting on what the BBC has said here. Um, I'm more than happy to talk to this group and I'm sure they've got some brilliant opinions to share with us, which, which we'd love to hear about, but we simply don't know what their opinions are because the BBC don't, don't reference it. They just give a few random quotes. Uh, anyway, that, that's one of the social media groups. Uh, th this magazine here um, says uh, that's all they all met on Twitter. So it seems to be a Twitter group. Nothing wrong with that. It's a Twitter group. So it's not an international formal group. They've been working together remotely on an informal and voluntary basis during the pandemic. So this is the international group of scientists that the BBC uh, is referring to. So we'd like some references, please, from the BBC. Now, in this article, of course, the BBC give no references, which is just... Well, it's nothing short of pathetic, is it? But they give no references. Uh, although I, I, I managed to dig around and find out some of what they were talking about. The BBC can reveal that more than a third of 26 major trials from of the drug for use on COVID, that's ivermectin, um, have serious errors, signs of potential fraud. What is a third? It's, 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 it's nine. It's just under nine, isn't it? Three. So, so basically, it must be saying that 17 or 18 of these trials are OK, but there's a few dodgy ones. Um, of the 26 that they reviewed would be an inference possible inference from that uh, let's go on a recent study in lebanon was found to have blocks of 11 patients that had been copied and pasted repeatedly apparently so they've picked on one study from lebanon here uh, oh but they've said they've retracted that so that's been retracted what study are they talking about we don't know uh, we could well be that one um that's just me searching around, seeing what I can find. Could be that one, but that one doesn't seem to be retracted. So normally if a study is retracted, I'll have retracted over it. So again, what study are they talking about? Don't know. They, they don't deign to tell us. But we don't need to know that. All we need to do is, I mean, surely their conclusions are good enough for us. We don't know to need to know the evidence, do we? 
Then there's a study from Iran. Now, the study from Iran I'm talking about, I think, is probably this one. Again, they don't tell us. This is just me putting some names together and looking around. I think they're probably talking about that one. It's got the same lead author that they mention, and it's got the same uh, information where they're looking at uh, low, uh, looking at oxygen saturation levels. So it could well be that study, but we don't know because they don't they don't tell us. But apparently the records of how much iron was in the patient's blood contained a number of sequences that was unlikely to come up naturally, okay, they said. Uh, the, the, lead, the doctor in charge of the study, um, the doctor in charge of this study said, um, who led the study, um, defended the results and the methodology and disagreed with the problems pointed out to him. So there's, a, there's clearly a scientific debate going on here, but. How much iron, of course, is not the major parameter. I mean, iron's important, of course, for carrying oxygen, but I'm not sure that's the main point of the study. Anyway, this doctor from uh, Iran added, uh, it was very normal to see such randomizations when a lot of different factors were considered. So a legitimate debate of science there. But I don't think there's enough to um, debunk that article, even if some of the uh, figures given for the patients, the iron and hemoglobin levels were... Um, inaccurately reported. What about the rest of the study? They don't seem to comment on that. Now the BBC article does say ivermectin is generally considered a safe drug although there have been some reports of side effects. Well yeah imagine that a drug that has side effects. Well we have looked at ivermectin on, on the uh, the Vigi base before and seen it's a remarkably safe medication. That doesn't tell us whether it's efficacious in COVID or not it just tells us it's been safe in the 3.7 doses or essentially safe relatively safe compared to other drugs or safer than other drugs. The other drugs we compared it to from memory were um, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, and amoxicillin, which had um, many, many times more adverse events reported about them than ivermectin has. Um, so they, they, they agree, it's, but there, there are side effects. So, And then they go on to talk about the horrendous reports that we've had from the United States of people taking huge doses of um animal intended ivermectin and getting overdoses and having to be hospitalized so again clearly ludicrous taking animal ivermectin but that tells us nothing about what human ivermectin is is is, is good or bad or not um but indirect harm can come from giving people a false sense of security now i agree with this especially if they choose ivermectin instead of seeking hospital treatment for covid i agree with that or getting vaccinated in the first place i agree with that but that, those three valid points there, again, tells us nothing about the efficacy or otherwise of ivermectin. We, we are no further forward on that. It tells us nothing. Some groups uh, regularly contain posts about conspiracy theories of ivermectin cover-ups, as well as pushing anti-vaccine sentiments or encouraging patients to leave hospital if they aren't getting the drug. Again, yes, all these things are bad, Um it's bad not to get vaccinated. It's bad to push conspiracy theories. Uh, it would be bad to leave hospital if you're not giving a particular medication against the advice of your doctors, of course. But that tells us nothing against about the efficacy of the drug again. It's another red herring. And then they conclude the article with this terrible story about a South African nurse that died. Apparently, instead of consulting a doctor, she continued with ivermectin and home oxygenation and sadly died. So this is one tragedy in South Africa. But the whole point about research is we can't extrapolate general principles from specific instances. We have to take the specific from the, the generalities that only research can give us. We must think deductively, not inductively. We must think from the general to the specific, not from the specific to the general. So I, I would suggest that the BBC has put forward a classic example of a invalid inductive thinking there if the journalists want to get hold of me to argue that point of course they're more than welcome to do so anyway um what, what's the bbc study talking about so i've looked all over for this uh paper on the 26 studies and it simply doesn't exist so what we have to conclude here unless i've and i've spent about an hour looking for this all over with every possible search i could find this group of five academic Twitter friends um, do not seem to have published their results on their analysis of the 26 studies that they have analysed where they found a third of them were probably uh, inaccurate or fraudulent. Uh, it doesn't seem to be published, so we don't know what it is. So the BBC is quoting unpublished evidence. 
which I find, I must say I'm surprised, it's surprisingly bad, surprisingly bad practice, arguing from unpublished evidence. I mean, it's one thing to argue from peer review evidence. It's another thing to argue from um, preprint paper evidence before peer review. But to argue from no evidence at all, which appears what the BBC seems to be doing. Um, this is, this is, these are direct quotes from this study that the BBC... So this is the only study I could find written by these five uh, international cyber friends. Um, this is the only one I could find. Seems to be the one that the BBC is talking about. And this is it. It is just a discussion paper on the practicalities of doing um, um, meta-analyses. Now, this Elgazar study here that you mentioned here, I don't know why they've referenced that. What date was this published? So this 22nd of September. So this, the, 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 this study here by Elgazar was retracted weeks ago. So why on earth would they study, would they quote a source which has been retracted? I'll let you read the paper and see if you can work it out for yourself. But that's that's been that's been clearly retracted. That and this Algazar one, again retracted. So that puts the references down to five, doesn't it? Um, that sort of was did have methodological flaws that I believe this student did identify. Actually, to be fair to him, and uh, it has been retracted. So not a problem there because it's been retracted. Anyway, going on to what some of the things they said. Uh, we recommend that meta-analysis. <coughs> we recommend that meta-analysists, those who study meta-analyses, who, who study interventions with COVID nineteen, should request personal review IPD independent patient data. In all cases, so rather than getting the results from the study, they recommend that everyone who does a meta-analysis should go back to the individual patient data. I think that's a brilliant idea. The point is this data is simply not published and this is not possible. This is not done on any other studies that I've ever come across in my entire life. So they're asking for something completely, in my experience, and I must have been reading meta-analyses for about 30 years now, uh, that I really have never come across before. That This has been reduced to individualised uh, patient uh, data. Uh, it's not the way meta-analyses work so far, in my experience. In a similar vein, all clinical trials published on COVID-19 should immediately follow best practice guidelines and upload anonymised IPD, independent patient data, so that this type of analysis can occur. I agree, um, but the, again, this is simply not done. So they're recommending it should be done, and I, I agree it would be a good idea where it's possible, uh, where it doesn't compromise patient confidentiality, if that's possible, um, if it's possible. It would be a good idea. So scientifically, both of these things are good ideas, but they're simply not done. Any study for which authors are not able or willing to provide uh, suitable anonymised IPD should be considered at high risk of bias for incomplete reporting. So basically, all the meta-analyses that have been done in the medical literature up to now, according to this line of thinking, have to be considered at high risk of bias. So we always were taught that the highest level of evidence is, is, is a meta-analysis of randomised double-blind controlled trials. So it appears that's no longer the case now because all the meta-analyses of the randomised controlled trials over the past 20 or 30 years have not contained, uh, or nearly none of them have contained independent patient data. So it looks like most of the things we thought we know, we in fact don't know now, according to the logic of this study as I as I read it, which of course would cause quite a lot of confusion. So basically what I'm saying is, yeah, it's, it's a good idea in the real world, but it hasn't happened so far. Yes, of course, this is a brilliant idea, but is it going to happen? Probably not. Um, has it happened already? Not very often or virtually never. Oh, in fact, look, they, they say that. We recognise that this is a change to long accepted practice and is substantially more rigorous than the standards that are typically currently applied. OK, so what about all the information we currently have? Do we disregard that? Um, that's not mentioned. Uh, and I again stress that this is all just information from this short um, opinion piece from these uh, these five uh, authors. Um, we recognise that by recommending uh, independent patient data, review by default for meta-analysis of potential therapeutic agents of COVID-19, we are calling for a change nearly universally accepted to nearly universally accepted practice over many decades. 
So the universal accepted practice over many decades, they're not happy with that. They want to change it. So presumably that means we need to rip up every meta-analysis that's been done over the last 20 or 30 years. In fact, since I've started reading meta-analyses, uh, because it should be considered high risk of bias. This is clearly talking about an idealised world that simply doesn't exist, as far as I can see. So there we are. Now, I could carry on with a lot of other things. It's always hard to know where to stop on these. I'll give you one more thing. Um, the, the part, a large part of the problem is that, yes, a lot of the studies that have been done on ivermectin are led by clinicians. Yes, there's been some deliberate fraud, it would appear, in, in some cases. Um, but most of the research has been done by clinicians, by, by the doctors and staff pharmacists and things themselves. And of course, they're not full time researchers. And of course, they're busy with the day job anyway. So um, and they're not professional researchers necessarily. So it's very hard for these people to do that as they go along. Um, whereas perfect clinic, well, near perfect randomized controlled clinical trials like we had for the vaccines, they're, they're, they're conducted by Big Pharma in collaboration with multi-million dollar budgets. So really to compare one with the other is simply not fair. We have to take the evidence and put it together as we can find it. And that is what we see on uh, this group here. Now, this group is a bit mysterious. We don't know who they are, but they're a group of interesting academics. But what they publish seems to make sense. So this is the, the sort of real time meta analysis of oh, 64 studies here. Slightly more, 64 studies. They've obviously taken out the Elgazar study. So what happened is when, when studies are proved dodgy, this group here, now I don't know whether it's daily or weekly. I think I think it might be weekly, but every week they like rerun their analyses, which isn't that hard. You just click the button on the computer these days. And if there's a dodgy study, they simply delete it. <laughs> then the computer just reruns it and they get a different analysis. So the results I'm about to show you do not show the fraudulent Elgazar study from Egypt. They, they simply don't have it. So this, this is basically a lifetime meta-analysis, which is I've given you a reference for, unlike the 26 studies by this other group, which is not referenced and, as far as we know, completely unpublished. Um, so this is a really interesting site. I've put the links there. Do, do have a look at it, of course. Um, whilst, while many treatments have some level of efficacy, they do not replace vaccines and other measures to avoid infection. Of course not. We uh, this is exactly what we are saying. So let, let's just look at roughly what they're saying here. So they, they give all these meta analyses. Now, this line in the middle here is is uh, no difference. This would indicate that the treatment has a good effect. This would indicate that the treatment has a bad effect, basically on that side there. So this is ivermectin early treatment and prophylaxis studies. And there they come up with a 66 percent improvement from their analysis. Um, is that yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, that's early. Yeah, that, that's right. So if it's given, uh, yeah, ivermectin, this is, early, this is basically early treatment and prophylaxis. So if it's given early in the course of an illness, 66% improvement is the result of their meta-analysis, which is at least published. And we can go and read all of those for ourselves, unlike the mysterious 26 that we're not told about by the BBC, at least. Prophylaxis um, seems to be 86% improvement there. Uh, with ivermectin on those studies, all analyses, 75% improvement. And it gives you huge amounts of meta-analysis results data. So definitely showing um, positive results from that meta-analysis. Whether that's right or wrong or not, that doesn't really tell us, but it tells us the result of this meta-analysis is this particular meta-analysis is positive, and at least that's published for us to have a look at. Um, so we mentioned the pro this problem with clinical trials. Now, this is this is a quote from the Japanese Journal of Antibiotics. Uh, now, excuse my pronunciation, Japanese listeners. Kitasho, Kitasho University said this. This is a direct quote from their article. Based on the judgment that it is necessary to examine the clinical effect of ivermectin to prevent the spread of, uh, uh, of uncertain COVID-19, this university, Kashato University, asked Merck & Co. Uh, to conduct clinical trials of ivermectin for COVID-19 in Japan. 
Now, we should understand that the university, Kashato University, was going to give them their facilities and infrastructure, and we understand that they're linked with uh, a lot of national bodies in Japan, so they could have facilitated a clinical trial there, which makes perfect sense. Why did they go to Merck about this? Well, this company has a priority to submit an application for an expansion of ivermectin's indication since the original approval for the manufacture and sale of ivermectin was conferred to it. And we know that Merck, very generously indeed, has given millions and millions of doses to help eradicate scourges of uh, parasitic disease in the um, in the developing world. So full marks to Merck for its uh, track record on ivermectin in terms of uh, facilitating its availability as an anti-parasitic medication. So you would imagine that Merck would jump at this chance, wouldn't you? You would have thought. Anyway, they said, however, the company said it had no intention of conducting clinical trials. Now, um, a cynic might say that's because ivermectin is out of patent and you can't sell it and make a profit for it because any generic manufacturer can make it. But what do I know? I don't know. So that's the paper from the American Journal of Therapeutics. And these are the authors. Now, it looks like this is the lead author here. Looks like that's the second author. That's the third author. It looks like this is the third author. The third author is a Dr. Uh, Satoshi Amura. And Satoshi Amura works at uh, Kishato University, or is associated with it, it says there. In fact, he works at the Amura Satoshi Institute, Memorial Institute, because this is the man who won the Nobel Prize with uh, Dr. Campbell in 2000 and, uh, 2015 for his discovery of ivermectin. Along with William Campbell, jointly won the Nobel Prize. So fairly reputable authors there, really. But uh, Merck didn't want to play ball with the Nobel Prize winning uh, university, it would appear. Which is a great pity, because that would have given us a really high quality pharmacological industry led clinical trial. We'll leave that there for now. Thank you for watching.